Hey Honors Algebra 2, Algebra 2 students, Mrs. Fallon here. We are on lesson 9.5 of your student journals, page 264. So in this section, what we're going to be talking about is graphing some of our other functions. So we spent a lot of time graphing sine and sine functions and trans, trans, um, transforming them, you know, shifting them left and right and up and down, that kind of thing. Today we're going to talk about tangent functions. Um, we're going to get into cotangent, secant, and, and cosecant functions. So we're going to kind of talk about all the other functions. The nice thing is, is that they're all kind of related, right? So now that you know how to graph sine and cosine, the rest of the functions are, are kind of related. So first and foremost, what I think we should do is take a look at what a tangent function looks like on our graph. So I'm going to go ahead and clear out some of this stuff that I have in here. And I'm just going to hit tangent of, so if you've never done this, um, I strongly recommend that you do. Remember that you want your calculator in radian mode. So I need to go ahead and change my mode back to radian because I was in degrees. And then I'm going to hit graph. So the tangent function, as you can tell, is a way different looking graph than sine and cosine. Sine and cosine were that kind of that wave, that curve that had that, that max and min. Tangent, if you notice, uh, up and down, so like your range would be infinite, right? So there's like these little like waves, almost kind of like a, a heartbeat or, <laughs> or whatever. So what you might be noticing here is number one, it is a periodic function in the sense that it repeats a pattern over and over and over again. What you might also begin to recognize here, if you look on your own calculator or look on my screen, um, there's this branch, it kind of looks like a cube function. If you remember when we graphed y equals x, to the third power. That's kind of what this branch looks like. And it's repeated over and over again. And what happens is there's these lines in here that aren't actually in there, but what it is is there's an asymptote in between all of these branches. We call these branches of our function. And so each branch is approaching an asymptote at both sides. So, so it's hard to kind of see that on a graphing calcu calculator because it doesn't always, it doesn't generally show the asymptotes. Um, so it's generally easier to look at that on just kind of like draw it out on a paper. There are some differences when it comes to tangent functions. So tangent function is one that has an asymptote. So sine and cosine don't have any asymptotes. In other words, you know, the domain of their function is all real numbers. Their range is a set number of range, right? So it's like a between a min, a min and a max, but there's not really, um, there's not really an asymptote there. It's just kind of like the max of your function or the minimum of your function. Um, the period of your graph, instead of being two pi over b, um, for a tangent function, it's pi over b. And so again, it's because of this shape, right? It's because that this is not that curve. It's um, these individual branches are repeating a little bit quicker than what it did with the, the, the one period of a sine function or a cosine function. The amplitude is still your A value, and so we'll talk about what that amplitude does. Like in a sine or cosine function, remember the amplitude of a sine or cosine function kind of determined, like if you had the midline of your graph, it determined like where your max or your min would gonna be. Well, the amplitude of the graph isn't gonna really do much. I want you to think of like the amplitude, um, imagine if you had like y equals five tangent of x, okay? As opposed to y equals one, tangent of x. Remember what we call this number out in front. That's our vertical stretch. And so what it's going to do is going to pull your graph vertically. So see all these little branches here, right? If I graph y equals 5 tangent of x, it should have a vertical stretch. In other words, it should be pulled um, vertically uh, by a factor of 5. So you'll see, see how it almost actually looks linear. It's pulled so much. It kind of looks like those branches are linear. They're not, but it's pulled so much in the vertical direction that it almost kind of straightens out that curve. So remember, that's kind of what that amplitude does to our tangent function because it's going to change the overall like steepness of the graph. Um, what we're gonna be talking about a lot about the x-intercepts, notice that in our functions here, I'm just going to turn this one off. Uh, notice that there are values that the graph touches the x-axis. All of those x-intercepts are going to be important. So we're going to write a rule or an equation that represents all of those x-intercepts. And so when you write an x-intercept, remember it's, you know, your x value comma zero. And then of course, transformations. This is going to be your h and your k. Um, and so again, shifting left and right and up and down. All right, let's take a look at a tangent function. So the first thing I want us to do is we're just going to sketch one over here. So I'm going to kind of do, 
a big graph. Normally your tangent function, we generally kind of make it centered around the origin. So whereas a sine and cosine, we kind of go from the origin to the right. Most of the time, uh, a tangent function, we kind of center right around the origin. All right, so the first thing we do when we graph a tangent function um, is we find the period of our function. So let's say we're just gonna graph y equals tangent of x. So nothing fancy, just kind of like your basic tangent function. So the first thing I would do is find the period, which is pi over b. b is still the number being multiplied by x. So in this case, pi divided by one is pi. What I do is I take this period, okay, so the period is pi, and around the origin, I wanna have one complete period. So what I do is I take, I cut this period in half. So I take half of it, which is pi over two, and I make it to the right, and to the left. So from the distance from negative pi over two to pi over two is a distance of one pi, which is that's one period of my graph. So what that allows me to do is to number one, tell me where my function is located, but it also gives me the scale on my graph. So I have zero pi over two, I'm counting by halves pi's, you know, pi, three pi over two, two pi and so forth. And then of course go the other direction as well negative pi, negative three pi over two, and so forth and so on. All right, wherever this period is, so both ends of kind of both sides of my graph, those are gonna be where your asymptotes are because then my function is going to exist between negative pi over two and pi over two. So what, me, what that means is my function exists around here. So like this is kind of like the one complete period of my function. And so um, what we're gonna do is anytime where, like when I did half the period, right, and I put it to the right and to the left, those are gonna be your asymptotes. Notice the pattern here. So when I draw in my graph, this is gonna be an x-intercept, an asymptote, an x-intercept, an asymptote. So every other point on here is gonna be an asymptote. So this is an x that's an asymptote, x-intercept, asymptote, x-intercept, this is an asymptote. So skip one, this is an asymptote. So the pattern repeats over and over and over and over again. All right, here's kind of how you would use the amplitude. So the amplitude in this, in this function is one, right? So normally what you do is what you graph is you go, okay, so here's my x, these are all gonna be x-intercepts of our basic tangent function. So I start at zero and I look at, okay, I wanna get the branch of my function, right? It's gonna kind of look like that curve like we showed on here. So it's gonna look like this. So I want this one branch of my function. So I need to go halfway between zero and pi over two. And let's say my amplitude is one. I go halfway between zero and pi over two, which is pi over four. You can mark it if you want. And then go up to your amplitude, which is one. Do the same thing on the other side, like halfway between zero and this, this asymptote, which is negative pi over four. And then your amplitude is one, so go down to negative one. What this does is gives you two other points on your graph. So now you would graph your function. So this branch is gonna approach my asymptote and then this branch is gonna approach my asymptote. And that's your tangent function. And then basically what, that's one period of your tangent function. So to graph another one, you would kind of do those halfway points again and then you would just continue on with the pattern. And, you know, it kind of looks like this. Okay. And that would be your graph of your tangent function. So again, just kind of relating this back to what we've kind of, you know, done with the unit circle and so forth, what I want you to remember is that, like, think about your points, right? So you have a, you have x, and then you have y, or in other words, y is tangent of x. So in all of these, why we have asymptotes on a tangent function, as opposed to not having an asymptote on a sine or a cosine. Um, if we have, let's say if we have negative pi, we're gonna start at negative pi and go with negative pi over two, then zero, then pi over two and pi. So I'm just gonna do from negative pi to pi. If I plug in negative pi, tangent of negative pi, so remember, negative pi is like going backwards 180 degrees, 
which means if I go backwards 180 degrees, I'm here, which is the point negative one, zero. So if I go backwards 180 degrees, the tangent is y over x, zero over negative one, which is zero. So at negative pi, I have an x-intercept. Negative pi comma zero is my x-intercept. At pi over, negative pi over two, so negative pi over two means I'm going backwards pi over two, which means I'm down here. If I did y divided by x, sine divided by cosine, to get your tangent function, I would get an undefined. Any place you're gonna have undefined is where you're gonna ask them. If I did tangent of zero, again, that's right here. So that's one comma zero. Zero divided by one is zero. And so what you're gonna notice is anytime you have, um, you know, at 270 degrees, or if you have, um, or if you have 90 degrees, tangent of 90 degrees, it's undefined. And those are gonna be where you're gonna have um, your, your asymptotes at, okay? And everything else is gonna be, every, every, all the other quadrantals are gonna give you an x-intercept. So this would be an x-intercept, this would be an asymptote, x-intercept, asymptote, and then every multiple of that, of that all the way around. All right, um, how we can write this, so I'm just gonna kinda, fill in some of the, I'm not going to follow, so there's lots of information on these sheets and you're welcome to look through. I'm just going to kind of give you um, kind of a, a briefer version of what they have here. Um, all right, so the x-intercepts are always going to be, if you notice, if I asked you to write like the equation for all of the x-intercepts, because there's infinitely number of x-intercepts because this function goes on forever. What you want to do is you look at your first x-intercept, so generally around the origin, and then you look to see where the next one is. This is how, this is like your, your period, right? This is how, how much they're gonna repeat. Every pi, you're gonna have another x-intercept if you go backwards as well. So go backwards pi, go forwards pi, you're gonna have another x-intercept. So your x-intercepts are gonna be at multiples of pi. So instead of being x comma zero as your x-intercept, you're gonna have pi times x. So in other words, if x is one, it's going to be at pi. If x is 2, it's going to be at 2 pi. Um, if x is 3, it's going to be at 3 pi. If x is negative 1, it's going to be at negative pi. So any multiple of pi, you're going to have an x-intercept. So negative pi, 0, pi, 2 pi, and so forth. That's how you'd write kind of an equation to represent all of your x-intercepts. You can do the same thing for the asymptotes. Now the asymptotes are um, vertical lines, right? So these are vertical lines. So we're going to write an equation for a vertical line. And so remember, that is x equals. So again, what I normally do is I start with my first, my first asymptote. So x equals pi over 2. Okay, And then I say, okay, well, how often does it repeat? Well, it repeats the same as everything else, the same as the period. So if the period is pi, it's going to repeat every pi. From pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2 is a distance of pi. So that means it's going to repeat every pi comma, or pi x. In other words, every multiple of pi, it's going to repeat. So the equation for my asymptotes would be pi over 2 is my first one. You don't have to start at the first one, but I generally do. And then add every multiple of pi. So I'm going to start here, and then every multiple of pi jumps me to here, and then on and on. Or if I, if it was, you know, if x was negative, it would make me go backwards, so I'd be here and here. So that's how you write the equations for those, um, for, the, for like the x-intercepts and the asymptotes. All right, we're gonna take a look at a cotangent function. I'm gonna grab a separate sheet of paper. I encourage you to do so. Let's take a look at a cotangent function. All right, so y equals cotangent of 4x. So let's do it a little bit different. We're gonna change like the b value on here. All right, so we're gonna graph this kind of the same way. Now, a cotangent function, because it's not a tangent function, so a tangent function was kind of centered around the origin, and we took the period, and then we did half the period to the right and half the period to the left. Okay, that was, that was great. Cotangent function, we actually don't graph that way, or at least I don't. So what I'm going to do is I'm still going to start by graphing the period. So I have pi over b. In this case, b is 4. So this is one period of your graph, right? Pi over 4. So what I do is, so again, this is for a cotangent function. I am going to, kind of like I do with sine and cosine, I'm gonna go ahead and mark in here 
kind of my distance from zero to pi over four is one period of my function. Like, cotan like tangent, cotangent is also gonna have asymptotes. So I'm gonna use zero and pi over four as my asymptotes. And so then I can generate more, you know, I can extend this on. You can do the halfway point here, which would be half of pi over four is pi over eight. So that means I'm counting by kind of pi over eights here. So one eighth, two eighths, this would be three eighths, three pi over eight. Um, four eighths, which would be pi over two. And you could do five eighths and six eighths and so forth. So again, just like the tangent function, you are gonna have an asymptote or an x-intercept at every other point. Just the only difference is we didn't go, we didn't send it around the origin. We started at zero and did our, the period from zero to the right. That's kind of the only difference here. Um, everything else is kind of the same when it graphs a tangent function, the, um, other than the shape of the graph. So a cotangent function is a reciprocal. Um, and, it, and so what we're gonna do is instead of the graph kind of going this direction, it's gonna go the other direction. It's kind of like a negative um, x cubed function, to be honest with you. All right, but we graph it the same. So we look at the asymptote, and that's gonna be how you get your scale on your x and y, or on your y axis. And then you'd graph halfway in between, so halfway between zero and my x-intercept of pi over eight. Remember, all of these are x-intercepts. So halfway in between is pi over 16, because that's half, right? So 1 16th, 2 16th, this is 3 16th, so 3 pi over 16. So this, I just kind of use that to get my scale. And I'm going to plot a point up here, and then I'm going to plot a point down here. So again, it kind of looks like a straight line, but remember that it's not. And so you're going to stretch your graph, and it's going to approach your asymptote. Mine doesn't look perfect, but, you know, it's the right idea. And so you would, you know, plot your points as well and try to do the same. Ugh, that was terrible. It was supposed to go this way. Ignore this. Let's try one more time to see if I can get a better looking graph. <laughs> halfway in between up to your amplitude. And I ran out of room over here, but that's okay. So we'll call this our um, six pi over eight, which would be another asymptote. So then this would be down here. Like that. And so that would be your cotangent function. Again, same deal. It's gonna, you know, has an, an asymptote an x-intercept, an asymptote, an x-intercept. Now, obviously, if we shifted this up, then that would change. But for right now, we're not actually going to do that. You'll learn a lot more about that in like um, uh, pre-calc next year. If I wanted to write the equation for the x-intercepts, just show you how to do that. So again, my look at my first x-intercept, which is pi over 8. And then it repeats... Um, every, so what is our period here? Remember if we talked about the distance between our x-intercepts? Um, it's going to repeat every uh, pi over four. So we're gonna add pi over four x. So what I mean by that is I start here and then I'm gonna add every multiple of pi over four x. So if start here, then add pi over four and get here. Then add pi over four and get here. Then add pi over four and get to the next one. Same thing with the asymptotes. I'm going to start with my first one, which I'm going to start with the not zero. I'm going to start with pi over four. So remember, it's a vertical line. And then we are going to add every mul so every period. So it repeats every period, which is pi over four. So again, we're just going to do um, pi over four plus pi over four x. And that's going to be your equation for your asymptote. So that generates all of your asymptotes. All right, I'm gonna, we're gonna do two more graphs and then that's it. So I'm gonna show you how to graph a secant and then a cosecant function. So grab another sheet of paper. Let's graph a secant function. So what you wanna remember is that a secant function is the reciprocal of cosine. So that's the first thing we wanna remember. So how you graph this is you wanna first graph a cosine function. 
So if this is a this is a secant function that has no shifts. So what we're going to do is we're going to graph our basic cosine function. So if you remember, cosine of x has a period of 2 pi. So I'm going to go ahead and label that on here. I'm going to do the halfway point and then the quarter points, right, to get my five key points. A cosine function has an amplitude of 1, and then it has a midline right there at the x-axis. And then if the last thing, because there's no shifts here, we're going to start at a max, then the midline, then the min, midline, max. And so you're going to want to maybe extend this on. So we're counting by half pies here. So this is 1 half, 1 over 2, 2 over 2, 3 over 2, 4 over 2, 5 pi over 2, 6 pi over 2, which is 3 pi, 3 and a half pi, and so forth. And you can go backwards as well. So let's go backwards, negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi. All right, so the only reason I'm having you do this is so that you can graph some additional points, right? So if you go this way, you'd be down here at a min, then a midline, and then back up to a max. And then back down here to a min, and then back to a midline. So the first step is to graph your cosine function. Now, you can use, a, I would use a different color, or maybe, um, graph it really lightly, because technically the cosine function isn't part of your secant graph, um, but we use it to kind of help us graph a secant function. All right, so that's step number one, sketch a cosine function, because it's the reciprocal. Um, so here's what you all have to remember. With a secant function, remember it's the reciprocal of cosine. So anywhere cosine was zero, okay, anywhere cosine was zero, which means Cosine is zero at any x-intercept. Any x-intercept, cosine is zero. Anywhere cosine is zero is going to be a part of the function where um, secant is undefined because the reciprocal of zero is undefined. So I'm just going to write down here any x-intercept of cosine of x is an asymptote of secant of x. Right? So that should make sense because they're reciprocals of each other. So what that means is anytime I see an x-intercept, you're going to write in an asymptote. X-intercept. Here's an x-intercept. Here's an x So, you know, obviously depending on how much you graph here, you'll have a lot of different x-intercepts. Mine should be equally spaced out, but as you can tell, I didn't graph mine perfect. So, you know, use your imagination here to show that it's all equal. All right, last but not least, and this is the easy part. Um, you would think that, you know, we haven't really done anything yet when it comes to secant, but to be honest with you, the last thing is, is we are going to sketch, I'm just going to write down, uh, sketch your graph. So here's how we do this. I'm going to grab a different color pen so you can see. Any max or min, so any non-x intercept, this is going to be where your function is gonna approach your asymptote. So it's gonna look like a, so all you're really doing, if, so zoom in on just this piece. You're taking the reciprocal of this like, like parabola looking part of your graph. So when you do the secant of this piece, it flips it up. And so likewise, if I take the reciprocal of this piece, okay, it's gonna flip it down. So all of these, maxes and mins are going to be where my secant function exists, okay? Because all we're really doing here is we're taking the reciprocal. So again, this middle piece here is technically not part of your graph. We just used so that we could get a good feel for how to graph that secant function. All of these branches here are going to be your secant function. And that's it. Seems a little strange, right? Let's graph cosecant because it's very similar, and that'll give us a little bit more practice. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to graph, we'll do something a little bit different here. We're going to do 2 cosecant of pi x. So I changed the amplitude and I changed the b value. All right, same rules. 
Okay, let's start. We're gonna find, we're gonna start by sketching. Go off the grid here. Sketching the reciprocal function. So in this case, instead of the reciprocal of cosecant, is we're gonna be sketching a sine function. So you're gonna graph your basic sine function, y equals sine of x. I lied. We're gonna be graphing y equals two sine of pi x because we want to graph the exact same one, right? So two sine of pi x. So you're going to graph the same thing here, except you're going to call this sine. So how do we do that? Well, we start by finding the period of your function. So two pi over b. Since b is pi, that means the period is two. So we do that same thing that we've done before, where we graph kind of, I'm going to extend this out a little bit. Um, so going to be where the whole that's going to be one period of your function on your x-axis, and then we're going to do the halfway point and then the quarter points. So we're counting by halves. Whoops, this should be three over two. So one half, one, one and a half, two. This would be two and a half. You can use decimals; doesn't really matter. Three, three and a half, four, and so forth. All right, so extend your graph out. All right, amplitude. So the midline is at zero, right? Because we didn't do a k value. We didn't have any k values in our function. So now we're gonna do the amplitude. The amplitude is two. So we're gonna have up two and down two. All right, we're gonna graph a, c, a sine function to begin with. So again, I would encourage you to use a different color or write lighter or something. So a sine function normally starts at a midline. So we're gonna go midline max midline, min, midline. And then just follow that same pattern. Midline max, midline, min, midline. And then I'm gonna graph, I'm gonna extend the pattern on. So my sine function is gonna look something like this. Remember it's a nice smooth curve, not jagged edges. And it looks like that, okay? So same deal. Okay, we graph a sine function. Next step, any x-intercept becomes um, a asymptote. So x-intercept equals an asymptote. So any x-intercept of sine becomes an, becomes an asymptote of um, cosecant. So um, we're going to have an asymptote here and here. And all of the x-intercepts are going to now be asymptotes. Okay. Next, sketch your graph. Same deal. Because it's the reciprocal function, all you're really doing is you're taking this piece and you're reflecting it. So it reflects up. So this is a minimum. It's going to reflect down. This is reflecting up. This is reflecting down. So you will get this lovely looking graph. So again, I just want to reiterate that the pink graph in here, my sine function, isn't technically part of your graph, but we use it to kind of help us help guide us as we graph a cosecant function. All right, so you're going to probably be practicing a lot more of that, but for now, I would like you to practice this. Come to class with questions. Try to graph some of these on your own, and uh, let me know if you have any issues. All right, bye for now.